Welcome to the RE Podcast, the first dedicated RE podcast for students and teachers. Episode 7, the one where there's something going on. My name is Louisa Jane Smith and this is the RE Podcast, the podcast for those of you who think RE is boring, which it is and I'll prove it to you. Simon Donlevy is an agnostic bank manager who decided to go on a pilgrimage. A pilgrimage is a journey to a religious place or a journey for a religious reason. So why would someone who's not religious go on a religious journey? To find out why, I've invited Simon to talk to us. Welcome, Simon. Hello. Thank you for having me on the RE podcast. It's an absolute pleasure. So you, you did the Camino de Santiago. Can you tell us what that is? Yes, the Camino de Santiago is a pilgrimage to a city in northwest Spain called Santiago. In that city is Santiago de Compostela, which is a huge cathedral, which is famous because underneath the cathedral are the remains, allegedly, of St. James, who was one of Jesus' apostles. Amazing. I believe you hugged a statue of St. James. (laughs) I did, yes. How did you find out about the Camino de Santiago? If you'd have asked me three or four years ago, I wouldn't have known anything about it. Uh, I have a very dear friend called Neil, who retired with ill health, sadly. Uh, He's a strong Catholic, and he told me he was going to walk the Camino de Santiago. I I thought he was just going on a walk in the sun somewhere on a little hike. And it was only as we got to understand a little bit more about what he was about to undertake, (laughs) we realized the magnitude of it. Because of his ill health, a friend and I decided that we would just go out in the middle of his Camino just to check on him, just to check he was okay, take some stuff out for him or bring some stuff back, and hopefully to reassure his wife a little bit because we would, get, we would be going out in the middle of it. We needn't have worried. I mean, we went out, but he was being looked after by what I described as two angels sent from heaven who he'd met, who were really looking after him. And then we were there for three days, and, and I came back, and I just thought, wow, I, I've got to do that myself. It really had an impact on me. And actually, what you did do is come back and write your first ever poem. Why did you write the poem? And would you like to read a little bit to us? I've never written a poem in my life. I was on a train with work going to Chester from London. And for some reason, I started crafting this poem on my phone. And it is the, it's the start of, of, the, of my book, actually. But if I, if I read you the last little bit of the poem, start with the end. But he'll share the lessons away from the road in everyday life to unburden the load. And we should all learn from Neil and this holy ground to want nothing apart from those you can throw your arms around. There's something going on. And There's Something Going On is the title of your book. There's Something Going On by Simon Don Levy is out on the 16th of November. I've read it. It's a beautiful read. And actually that part of the poem that you've just read talks a little bit about what you learnt about what's important in life. And we'll come back to that in a little bit. But Let's talk a little bit about your sort of attitude towards religion, maybe before you did the Camino de Santiago. I was afraid of going into churches. I didn't like churches. I was fairly open-minded. I, I, believed, I believed in something. I was christened in Church of England, but other than christenings, weddings and funerals, I would avoid churches at all costs. I just found them quite uncomfortable places. I would have said I was not necessarily, will you use the word agnostic? That would probably be the best way of describing it before I went. And so what made you want to do the Camino? Those three days with Neil, the people that I met and spoke to, the, the spirit camaraderie, and there was just, well, just something going on. I came back and I was going to do that when I retire. And that was just one day when I thought, actually, what am I waiting for? I'm not going to wait till I retire. I'm going to do it now. So I just made it happen. Carpe diem sees the day. <laughs> And actually, you, you mentioned there that actually one of the most significant things of those little three days that you did were the people that you met. And when you did your own Camino de Santiago, you had the same experience. I mean, just talk a little bit about the types of people you met on the Camino. Oh, where to start? I, I mean, I've met hundreds of different people and from all walks of life and from all nationalities. And that was one of the beautiful things about it was there were no international boundaries, people from all all over the world, very few actually, from my own country, which was great. I didn't meet many people from England. And I love that. That just doesn't happen in, in real life. I try and explain it to you. You, you would walk, you, you may be on your own for hours, you may come across different people. And when, when you pass people, you, you exchange a buen camino, sort of have, a, have a good walk type phrase. Um, 
And sometimes you can see people are just lost in their own thought and just want to be left alone. Sometimes people just want to talk. And when you start talking to people, you, you will find sometimes it's just a, a nice, pleasant conversation, catching up, chewing the cards, how's it going? Sometimes people might need help or assistance. Sometimes people just might need to offload and talk. Sometimes you just listen. And, and it's, it's just incredible because you're all heading to the same place. You're all following the same path. You're all doing the same thing, albeit you might have started in different places and you might be walking at different paces. You do have something massively in common, which is you're all going to the same place. And, and there's a real spirit that comes from that where people just want to help and support each other. Fantastic. And so you have this real sense of connection and community with people that are strangers and that you might not have met. Mm. You mentioned there that they all did it for different reasons. For what sort of reasons did people do the Camino? Everybody will have their own reasons. A good way of summarising it would be the end of day one. It might sound really strange. I was three quarters of the way up the Pyrenees, two thirds of the way up. Stayed in an albergue, which is like a hostel. Uh, and in this hostel, they produced a, a, a peregrino meal, I called it a family meal. And at the end of that meal, we'd all stand up and give a round of applause to the people that had cooked our food. And then they said it was tradition for that albergue for everybody at the end of day one to stand up and explain why they were walking the Camino. And I think that's when it really hit me as to how important this was to everybody. Uh, it, the, the, the reasons ranged from at one extreme, some guy saying, I'm walking it because I can, to somebody at the other extreme saying, I've got three to six months left to live because I have cancer. And then everything in between. I remember there was a gentleman from Brazil that had, that had been in a motorbike accident and had broken every bone in his body. And his goal was to be able to walk the Camino. And that gave him the real inspiration and to, to aid him through his recovery. And he was there walking it. And there were three siblings, two, two sisters and one brother who were there from various states in the US who hadn't seen each other from since their parents had died in a car crash when they were much younger. Uh, and it had been like 20, 30 years since they'd last seen each other. And they'd all met up that day. Lots and lots of reasons for people to want to do it. Obviously, religion is a strong one and, and Catholicism being the main one out there. But everybody will have their own reasons. And what were your reasons or what were your expectations before you did the walk? So, so my youngest son joked that dad was going on a pilgrimage to find God. Um, it, it wasn't that. But, it, but dad was going on a pilgrimage to step off that hamster wheel and to go with an open mind to, to let the Camino talk to me if it wanted to. And I think that's the best way of approaching the pilgrimage is just, just go and accept what happens. So I had no ingoing assumptions, no expectations about what was going to happen to me. I wasn't expecting to come back and go running to church on the next Sunday. And that didn't happen. But it did open my eyes and it has renewed my faith. And so how would you describe your faith now? So you said that it renewed it. How would you describe your faith since you've come back? Stronger. I believe in some almighty God, whatever or whoever that may be. What I'm perhaps not so attached to is the brand of different religions. Um, that, that bit didn't come across to me. But I, but I do, believe, do believe there's something going on and, and I just can't dismiss that. So I, you just come across so many churches along the route in, in such barren towns. I mean, north, north of Spain is quite barren and remote, very mountainous, very flat in places. You can't help but wonder why these incredible edifices, you know, absolutely beautiful buildings with gold inside, why there would have been so many built <laughs> along this route if it, if it wasn't for some powerful reason. It just makes you stop and think. Absolutely. And I think a lot of our listeners will relate to that, that they believe that there's something beyond them, something greater than humans, but don't really feel comfortable with organised religion. So... Thank you for saying that, because I think a lot of people will relate to that opinion. Okay. One of the things that struck me as I read your book was the immense kindness of the people that you met. There's some really wonderful stories in your book, but is there one that you would like to share with us? Oh, there's one that definitely left a big impact on me, and that's a, a lady called Natalia who hosted a, an albergue, one of the hostels, in a place called Puente Lorena. She, um, she's one of life's most beautiful people. It's quite incredible, really. You enter an albergue and, and you're met by the host, and... and like it's their privilege to serve you as a pilgrim. And they treat you with such respect and, and such warmth. It's, it's not like they're trying to get your repeat business. It's not like you're going back next week or the year after. It's almost like it is an honour and a privilege to treat pilgrims and look after you. So 
that in itself is a generic statement. Clearly, it does apply to everybody, but certainly applied to a lot of the places that I stayed in. But back to Natalia, I, I won't give away the whole story, but needless to say, Chris and I walked in after probably about a 25-kilometre walk that day. It was very hilly over the hills from Pamplona. I remember that. It was very hot. We were very tired. And within five minutes of walking into her reception, the three of us were holding hands and were sobbing. Real tears. Very, very, very unusual. Definitely something going on. What a wonderful story. And to find out why they will have to read your book. But thank you so much for sharing that with us. You're welcome. So some of the time when you were doing your walk, you were completely on your own, by yourself, not speaking to other people. But you had a significant experience in those moments. Just talk to us a little bit about that. Yes, it's really, it's really strange. So I, I walked it with Chris, so we would be together at the end of every day, but we didn't necessarily walk next to each other throughout the whole day. We'd often be you know, 500 metres a kilometre apart from each other and just meet up at odd times. But if you, if you imagine you get up at half five, six o'clock and start walking, it could be nine, half past nine, you've been on your own for two or three hours just walking and you just get lost in your thoughts. Beautiful. It really is beautiful. You just have the rhythm of your own footsteps or sometimes the rhythm of rain landing on the hood of your anorak. But I kept having this feeling sometimes where, where there was somebody behind me and I had to step to the right-hand side to let them pass. I wasn't on my own. There was somebody behind me. And every time I turned around there, there wasn't anybody there. And it really, ordinarily, it would have freaked me out. I don't know what's going on. But it was, it was almost comforting. But it was really strange. And then, then the very strange thing about that is that I, I never mentioned that to anybody. It was obviously just a thought for myself. And then I had a friend called Stuart come out to walk with me towards the end of my Camino. And about four days into our walk, he walked up to me and he said, Simon, I've got to share something with you. It's really strange, but every now and again, I feel like there's somebody behind me and I have to step to the side to let them pass. There's nobody there. And it was always on his left-hand side. So it was really strange. And we just sort of both looked at each other and I told him my version. And uh, we stood there with shivers going up our spine, just going, OK, what's all that about? And it certainly does sound that there is something going on. There's one part of, of the walk which is meant to be the highest part of the Camino. Explain what that place is and why it's significant. It's called the Cruz de Ferro. It is the highest place along the Camino. And if I start off with the night before, I, was, uh, I went to Vespers in a beautiful little church in a place called Rabanal. And after Vespers, one of the monks stood up to talk to the congregation. And he said, tomorrow you will reach the highest point on the Camino. You will get to the Cruz de Ferro. It is the nearest place to God. And he left it hanging and he had a look in his eye, which was something along the lines of, you'll see. And I, and I knew from talking to Neil about it that it would be quite an emotional and significant place. And, and the tradition of the Cruz de Ferro is that you you take a stone or a pebble from home to place at the base of the cross. Now, this place is not early on in the Camino, so you don't want to take a large stone because you're going to be carrying it for a few weeks. So um, I've taken a relatively medium-sized pebble. And what you can do, what a lot of people do, is they will write or leave messages on the pebble that are personal to them. It can be for loved ones, lost ones, people that have... I read some of the messages, people that had left home but hadn't returned. Very very significant reasons for very different people. And on the, on the way up to the, to the cruise, I'd got the stone in my pocket and I remember holding it. And I'd chosen the stone with my niece, Lucy, before I went and did it at Easter. Uh, and I felt really tearful just walking up there because I'd, I'd been three or four weeks away from home at that point. Four weeks away from home at that point. And it just reminded me of home and very, very significant how important my family is to me. And it, it, it's difficult to imagine, but it's not a... It's not a a little mound of pebbles. For 2,000 years, people have been doing this. So it's a small mountain they have to climb up to get to the base of the cross. And all around the cross were different people for different reasons. Some were, some were wailing, some were in silent prayer, some played a little bit of music while they went up to place their stone and came back down. Everybody had their different reasons. It was, it was a very poignant place. And I think, I think I was with Stuart and Chris at that time, the three of us, we didn't speak to each other probably for about an hour. But we just sort of stood and walked around it in different times, um, just lost in our own thoughts, whatever they may be. 
And how wonderful that you were connected to all the pilgrims before you in that moment and all, everybody that had ever placed a stone over the last sort of thousands of years. Uh, how wonderful. So you mentioned your niece Lucy there and you chose the stone together and placed it. One of the things that you decided was to raise money and the charity that you raised money for was inspired by Lucy. Talk to us about that. Lucy's my niece. Uh, she's, she was 12 just before I went. Uh, she's visually impaired and she and her family get a lot of support from a charity called Look Sussex, who do some fantastic things for visually impaired kids in Sussex. So I, I thought long and hard about whether I should raise money whilst doing my Camino. And on, on one hand, I, I didn't want to put the pressure on myself to do it because I wasn't quite sure I was going to make it to Santiago. But on the other hand, Look Sussex had been so good to Lucy, it was, it was a bit of a no-brainer to coin a phrase. So I decided that I, I would raise money. And, 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 you know, I have to thank everybody that sponsored me. We raised just under £6,000 for Look Sussex, which is no insignificant amount. I mean, an awful lot to them. Uh, it, was, it was just a, a nice byproduct of my Camino. That's so wonderful. And I think we'll put a link to Look Sussex in the show notes. And on the subject of charity, your charity work did not stop there. One of the things that the Camino inspired you to do was to continue with some charity work what have you been up to yes it did I, on one of those days where you're lost in your own thoughts for, for hours I decided that when I came home I would do some volunteering work I, I had after all decided to take six months off as a sabbatical and I had four and a half months left when I got back the first thing I did on my sabbatical was the Camino so I came back and told Lisa my wife what I wanted to do and started looking around she, she went for a walk with a friend and came back and said, I found the ideal place for you to do your volunteering. And it's a place in my hometown, Worthing, called Worthing Care for Veterans. And I absolutely love it. So I would go in on a Thursday morning and I'd just play games with all the veterans. They're all in wheelchairs and we'd do anything from dominoes to, to darts on a brave day. Uh, but I loved it. And I was building up a really good rapport with some of the residents. Some of them seem to look forward to me going in uh, I certainly look forward to going in, but sadly, because of COVID, I've not been able to get back in there since March this year, albeit I am still in touch with them. I um, really miss it. And I'm sure they absolutely miss you too. And that's so wonderful that you're giving up your time like that. Well, how else do you think the Camino has changed you or maybe your attitude to yourself or your attitude to life? It's, it's really interesting because people say, how can you go on a walk and it change you? And I get that. But you, you have to experience it and it, it just gives you that time to stop and think and reflect. My whole outlook on life has changed. For example, when my sabbatical came to an end and I went back to work, I was adamant I was going to carry on helping at Care for Veterans. And I managed to get an agreement with my boss that I could continue to take Thursdays off work and make up the hours outside of Thursdays so that I could continue to support Worthing Care for Veterans. That was just one thing that I would never have done before, but much further and much deeper than that. So I had lived with very meager possessions for five weeks. I, I had a six kilogram backpack. I had a set of clothes I was wearing and a spare set that was in my backpack. Pretty much nothing else. And I had three basic needs every day, which was to walk, obviously, to find something to eat, and then find somewhere to sleep. And if I met those three basic needs, I was really happy. And it was a bonus if I found somewhere to wash a set of clothes and, and put the dry set on in my back. So there I am in the middle of nowhere with a small backpack with three basic needs a day, being incredibly happy, obviously missing my loved ones around me. But that in itself teaches you what's important in life. And now I've come back home, you realize you don't need all those material things that we have in our world. It really is just those you can throw your arms around to the point where for years I've always had the the threat of being made redundant working for a high-speed bank in the UK. It happens a lot. And even in a COVID environment now, the chances of you know, redundancy is likely to be higher. I'm sure there'll be lots of organisations going through the same next year. But I'm just not worried about it because I've learned that I don't need much in life. As long as I've got my loved ones, I'm going to be happy. And that's absolutely wonderful. And I, I certainly feel that you've brought some of that Camino spirit, that magic home in terms of your kindness and your generosity and your contentment with very, very beautiful small things in your life. Mm. Is there anything else you would like to say to our listeners before we close? 
there'll be some listeners, I'm sure, thinking, how can you go on a, a hike or a walk and it completely change your outlook on life? Uh, and I get that. My answer to that would be, go do it and find out. Wonderful. And actually, they can read your book and get a real sense of, of what it's like and the highs and the lows and the challenges and the kindness and the generosity. There's a, a wonderful story in your book about a cornfield, which I won't spoiled for people that want to read your book, but I would really encourage people to read it just for that story because it, it really is very beautiful. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's making me smile just hearing you talk about it now. It's something that I'd forgotten about actually, but it is and was a very special moment for myself and for Chris. Let me say no more. Thank you so much, Simon, for, for spending this time with us and giving up your time to talk to us. Your book, There's Something Going On, Simon Don Levy, is out on the 16th of November and we'll put a link to that, as I said before, and I really encourage you to read it. And maybe some of you would be inspired now to walk that Camino. So, Simon, thank you very much. You're welcome. I've enjoyed talking to you. My name is Louisa Jane Smith and this has been the RE podcast, the podcast for those of you who think RE is boring, which it is, and I just proved it to you. But thank you so much for letting me bore the life out of you.